Have you wanted to use your home equity to pay off debt or improve your house, but found the old way too painful? There's now a new, better option for accessing your home equity. It's called HomePace. Here's the key. It's not a loan, so there's no monthly payments or interest. Instead, HomePace gives you money up front as an investment in your home. That's right. You get money that you can use however you want without the burden of monthly payments. Then someday when you decide to sell, you share a portion of the gains or losses in your home's value with HomePace. That means if your home's value drops, HomePace takes a loss too. HomePace gives homeowners a better choice to access home equity. No monthly payments, no interest. To get an instant quote, go to HomePace.com quote. It takes less than five minutes. That's HomePace slash quote to get started. Welcome to Thriving Through Menopause, where we talk about this time of life, mind, body, and spirit. I'm your host, Clarissa Christensen. Each week, I'm joined by top professionals dropping their tips and advice. Remember, episodes drop every Tuesday. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a beat. And if you like this podcast, please rate and review it. Thank you, because this helps others to find the show. You can check out our website, Find out which episodes are coming up and get the latest blog and advice by going to my website, thrivethroughmenopause.com and get ready to thrive, not just survive, through perimenopause and beyond. Welcome to another episode of Thriving Through Menopause. I'm your host, Clarissa Christensen. Andropause. That's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm turning around and realizing that we should be taking it more seriously. And so when I came across an article, I thought, wow, I need to talk to the person who authored this. And so I'm delighted to be joined today by James Davis. He is the co-founder of 38 Degrees North and the host of the Midlife Mentors, which is a very popular podcast. Welcome to the show, James. Hey, Clarissa. Thank you for having me on. I'm thrilled. Tell me a little bit, first and foremost, about what is Andropause. So andropause is, is simply a natural process that all men will go through pretty much from, can it, it strike them anywhere from their late 30s through to their late 60s. Shorthand, some people like to refer to it as the male menopause. Now, it's obviously incorrect because menopause is you know, referring specifically to the cessation of the monthly cycle for women. So men cannot have a menopause. But at the moment, as you said, you know, the word andropause is very little used and very little understood. So when you say andropause to people, I used to look at you blankly going, oh, what is that? If you say male menopause, like, oh, yeah, midlife men. And I guess we're not trying to detract from the menopause there. We want to start using the term andropause definitely because it is a male specific. But although what happens for men and women are very different, there are similarities. And some of those similarities are, it's likely to, to hit men around the same age as women. So then if you've got a heterosexual partnership and you know, the woman's going through menopause and the man's going through andropause, that can create a huge divide if they don't really understand individually what's going on for them and also you know, what's going on for the other partner. So I think there's a great education piece to do here, not just for men, but for women to understand what's happening as well. And it's so great that the menopause has come on in leaps and bounds. There's so much more menopause awareness now, so much information out there, which is fantastic. What we want to do is start talking a little bit about the andropause and get that awareness out there for men. Yeah, you're right. In a heterosexual partner, if both are going through it at the same time, it can really add to a lot of the tensions that are there. We don't understand each other maybe a recognition that it's real and I think that's the thing when somebody said it to me the first time I have to admit I rolled my eyes and now I realize that no there is real physiological change going on there absolutely is and you know for for men and women again looking at similarities a women's menopause is mainly driven by the change in her sex hormone levels so estrogen progesterone they are dropping off and for men it's the same but our primary sex hormone is of course testosterone now, we don't have a pronounced drop for women. So what's happening for men is their testosterone levels will peak in their 20s, but then start to decline between 1% and 2% a year on year, which doesn't sound a lot, but think of the compounding effect by that. So you could have a guy who hits 50, his testosterone levels could be 30 to 50% lower. Now, why does that matter? We think of testosterone around strength, muscles, libido. Yes, it is all that, and we'll probably talk about that in a minute, some of the, some of the physical factors, but it also plays a role in cognition, brain function, your energy levels, your confidence levels. This is why some men at midlife are something like, I just feel a bit, eh, I haven't got the energy, my libido's gone, I don't feel as confident. 
everything seems a bit of a struggle. I'm getting confused more. Yeah, very similar symptoms to the women experience some of the menopause. You know, women always talk about it, kind of the brain fog and things like that. Men experience a very similar thing or can do. What's interesting is I think why it's not had much prominence, men are notoriously bad at seeking help for issues like this. So there's a whole stack of research that the men are less likely to reach out to their health professionals, their GPs. And currently the stats say that around 10% of men would experience severe symptoms of andropause. And between 30 and 50% of men will experience some symptoms of andropause. But actually, I think that's underreported because if you think about it, logic, that decline in testosterone is across the board for all men. So it's just a question of, of when you start to notice it. It's, if it's happening fairly rapidly for you, it could be in your mid-40s. It could be in your late 60s. But at some point, you're going to be like, oh, my body's letting me down here. I'm not sure what's going on. And I think a lot of men just chalk it up to aging and not realizing there is this hormonal cocktail of changes going on underneath the bonnet, as it were, that's driving a lot of this. Yeah, I got, as you said, men are notoriously bad at that, talking about it. But, you know, most unlikely to seek medical help. They don't seek psychological help. I work within a group of psychologists and psychotherapists who are who have been long time targeting men just to get men to talk. And you're right, a lot of the men that we've talked about have low levels of depression and anxiety and just are not motivated to do anything. They're struggling at work in very similar ways to when we're talking menopause at work. I think andropause at work for midlife men is incredibly important too. Oh, certainly, because they're feeling this kind of, if you've got that, you've got the higher levels of anxiety, maybe tipping into like mild depression, you're feeling less confident in yourself. You start to begin to second guess everything. At the same time, you've got this brain fog coming in, again, driven by your low hormone levels. That's quite a cocktail to start making mistakes, tripping yourself up, second guessing yourself, and really undermining you in, in all kinds of ways. And that's before we all get into like traditional male identity and how men define themselves and generally a bit strong and energetic. And you know, the, the lack of testosterone means we're losing our muscle mass, which means we're losing our strength, we're losing our energy. So there's this physical side to it as well. And if we want to get into the psychosexual realm as well, testosterone obviously is a driver for libido. If that's dropping off and you're, you're, you're maybe struggling in the bedroom department, of course, that can have a massive knock-on effect as well. So there's all these things going on at this time in life. Throw, throw some good like general midlife stress from all the world in there as well. And you've got like a, quite a toxic cocktail. In a sense men struggling alone it's a man just then retires to his man cave or watches tv and women are then go he does his veg out on on the couch he doesn't do anything anymore or as you said in the psychosexual she says well he's not interested in me so he must be having an affair and that builds up toxic space between couples that they then can't resolve without sometimes outside intervention and if there's no understanding of andropause that conversation never gets to some other solutions absolutely and at the moment it's, it's like a double-edged sword almost because yeah, menopause i think is more well known now and even men understand if they don't know the ins and outs of it but they know that women go through a thing called the menopause they go oh this could be menopause you know, men might not even know about andropause so, so it's not like the, the women going, oh, you're going through andropause, this could be happening. The men themselves don't even realize what's happening because it's just not talked about. And I do think we have this issue with men of wanting to self-fix. We're taught to be self-reliant. So it's, I won't seek help. I'm just going to figure this out on my own. And maybe that does mean sitting in my man cave and watching TV for hours on end, which isn't going to fix it, guys. Sorry. But there, there is stuff you can do. Absolutely. But talk a little bit more about the symptoms because we've kind of touched a little on them. What are some of the most common symptoms of andropause? Yeah, so the physical symptoms would be you start to notice a reduction in muscle mass and strength. Of course, with that, your metabolism starts to slow because muscle is metabolically active. The less muscle we carry, the lower amount of calories we're burning. So then, of course, the other side effect is we'll start to see weight gain, particularly in abdominal area. For men as well, the, the belly starts to spread out, the waistline starts expanding. So so it's kind of, oh, my strength is going and I'm putting on weight or I don't really want it, essentially like more body fat. In tandem with that, you know, we have lower energy levels, spilling over into the kind of mental, emotional, psychological side. It can be, as we said, you know, problems with cognition, lower self-esteem and mild levels of anxiety, mild levels of depression. And then, of course, if you put all those factors together, that in itself can start a whole psychological flywheel turning of, of negative thinking and negative patterns. Definitely. And when you say that, there's so much similarity to, to menopause, this holding on to weight and general weakening. And of course, men have other things like they go bald, don't they? That's who it was like, hair thins, your skin thins. And this is why both men and women age. It's basically 
for both of us, our sex hormones are declining. Also, another hormone, human growth hormone, which plays like, it's, it's called the youth hormone. It plays a role in regenerating all of our cells. That's declining. Levels of things like collagen in the body are declining. So this is why as we get older, we get more tendency for injuries because our, our ligaments and tendons are weaker. Our skin becomes thinner. It's got less collagen, less elasticity. Our hair becomes thinner. All the going on. And again, you know, that, that can play a major part psychologically if you're not starting to, to like what you're starting to see in the mirror as well. Yeah, and that's why in some places you've definitely seen an increase in men's cosmetic surgery, which, which hasn't been common, should we say, but I think some men in their 40s who can afford it are actually going down that route. Yeah, I think we are definitely seeing more of that. That's not an area I know much around, but I do know it is, is a growth area, definitely. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. When I was living in, a, in Australia, a lot of men were really investing heavily in Botox and the rest because there's a big emphasis on physicality in a country like that, say, relative to what one might see here in Europe. Yeah. Oh, I understand that. It makes perfect sense. And again, that's a kind of a way, we can look at it as a kind of way of trying to maintain that youthful appearance. And in a way, psychologically, that's trying to maintain it. It's why we have this really tired stereotype of the male midlife crisis. The guy hits that age and suddenly he's got the shirt unbuttoned to the waist for medallions, the bald hair flowing in his open top sports car with the you know, 20 something year old girl next to him. It's a tragic attempt to recapture youth and it's misdirected, but we shouldn't actually laugh at it. it. It's coming from a place actually of deep... We talk about women's stereotypes in the menopause and how women are portrayed, but I think men are equally, aren't they, James, portrayed, as you said, being strong, fit. Yeah. And, and you see, I've seen men more do other things, not the sports one, but really go hard and start roaming marathons and pumping great amounts of iron and, and really trying to recapture youth in that way, rather than bought a sports car and got a younger girlfriend. <laughs> Which is not a solution, guys. <laughs> No, it's ne that's never the solution either. It's very costly to get divorced in midlife. But, and I think it's interesting you talked about also higher risk for injuries because if men are then saying, oh, go harder, try and recapture it, there, there's actually this potential to really end up hurting and damaging yourself. Yeah, and again, what happens is you know, men tend to like bond this self-image of themselves in their in maybe their twenties when they, you know they could oh I can run onto the football pitch and you know, it's like it's every man's dream if I'm, I'm watching an international and someone gets injured oh I could step on and fill in for them. So a common mistake that, that I see midlife men making is they feel their bodies starting to let them down. But they're putting on weight where they don't want it. It's, I'm going to go back and do what I did in my twenties. Or just go harder at it or do double of it. Actually, you're working against the hormonal changes in your body. Listen, you, you can transform your body in midlife still. You, there is lots of ways you can do it, but it's about being smarter with your training and really applying science to it, like shorter workouts and more recovery time. Getting on the treadmill and running for an hour a day is, is not the, the solution to your problems for, for men or women, and it's something that we see all the time. Yeah, no, that is, and that often becomes that. And I think trying harder, women are tending to diet more, maybe that's a more culture there. Men, it's, it's train harder. But, but I mean, one of the things is we've talked about it being the male menopause, but it's not menopause. How is it actually fundamentally different, even though there are similarities? So the, the main difference comes down to the hormonal difference. And I guess that there's two sides to that. There's a physiological side. So for women, it's obviously their estrogen and progesterone declining. For men, it's their testosterone. So it's andropause because testosterone is known as an androgen. So it's the cessation of androgen. But it's essentially the same thing, that the level of the sex hormones are tailing off, which is meaning physical, emotional, mental changes. I'd say where we have to be careful is for women, there's obviously like a bigger psychological aspect to it because menopause marks the end of their fertility life cycle. Once you're post-menopause or you can no longer bear children, Whereas for men, even though our testosterone declines, we can go on producing children right, right on into old age. So that's a very important psychological difference, I think. But essentially, for men and women, we've got, the, we've got these cocktails of hormones that, that are, are do similar things for us, but are tailored to our different gender. And as they both fade away, as we age, we do have similar things going on in the body. Yeah, that, that's, and that I think is the common link. I liked that, that it was similar things happening, but really for different reasons that are built to our different function with respect to sex, to our sex and our definition of our sex. A lot of the time we talk about men aging and becoming like a silver gray fox and it's all fine. But actually that's not true because men have faced similar aging stereotypes than to women. How's that come through in your experience, James? 
Yeah, I think that's true, you know. And again, I think we can hold, you know, I'm sure it happens to women as well. People will hold up someone like, you know, Jennifer Aniston and go, oh, look, she's in her 50s. Look how amazing she looks. But that's probably not typical of the woman in the street. In the same way, if a man will go, oh, look at George Clooney, the silver fox. He looks amazing. But again, if you're going to look at the average, like, 55-year-old guy in the street, he's probably not going to present in that way. So... It's tricky. We have to be really careful with when we're looking at these stereotypes, I think, around aging and menopause. It's good to have aspirations to go for, but tailing it out right around what works for us and what makes us happy within ourselves. And there's no point going for unattainable extremes. Both those examples I go there, obviously, they've had decades of being highly successful and affluent, which has allowed them to have access to better health information, et cetera, et cetera, which is a better diet, better movement all that kind of stuff. If you get a guy who's lived off his life for 50 years off Greg's sausage rolls, he's probably going to look very different to George Clooney, let's be honest. But it's never too late to start making positive changes. I always say to people that the best time to start was yesterday and next best time to start is today because if you don't start addressing what's happening, you think you feel you think you feel like pretty horrible about yourself now. If you don't start making some positive changes, it's only going to get worse and worse. And you don't deserve that. And no one deserves that. And, and no one should have to live that way when there is stuff you can be doing. Menopause is more than just your symptoms. It is without doubt the single biggest biopsychosocial change in a woman's life. And Clarissa Christensen has teamed up with international best-selling author Dawn Bates to bring you a book like no other. The Potent Power of Menopause, a culturally diverse perspective on feminine transformation. If you are looking for honest information, a holistic view and humour, then this book is for you. It reframes our experience of menopause and offers powerful insights into why this life transition is a gateway into a new and meaningful phase of women's lives. You can pre-order the copy online by going to the link in the show notes or by going to my website, clarissachristensen.com slash menopause. Yeah, and let me think about that. Women, there's been a big conversation about ageing and women with respect to things like Alzheimer's and osteoporosis, which are, of course, predominantly female illnesses. But for men, it isn't at things like heart disease that really become the big issue at this stage. Yeah, tends to be heart disease. I think for men, tragically, one of, one of the standout stats is suicide rates for, for midlife men in the UK are, are the highest of any group. They're almost five times that of women across the board. So there's a big mental health aspect. So that's not as simple as Andrew Ward. There's, there's a combination of, of factors there, but there's definitely a big one. And then on the health side, it tends to be things like, I've got to say it's probably more lifestyle related. So heart disease, drinking related issues, and things like liver issues, stuff like that. Yeah, really. And they in themselves are just going to compound everything that andropause kind of throws up with the weight and the, and the depression. Yeah. We all know, like, I think one, one of the lessons we've seen from COVID is whatever you do, like, the, the healthier you are when you face something, the world is going to throw stuff at you. The healthier you are, the better placed you are to deal with it going forward. And we've seen, we've seen that, unfortunately, in, in the health stats with this disease that's come out. You can apply it to anything. The healthier you are at the point something happens to you, the better your outcomes are across the board. So, so why not start, start changing those outcomes? I always say to people as well is, do you think about the time ahead? Because often, particularly in midlife, I think we want to avoid it because we're very conscious like we're at the halfway point or probably slightly beyond. We've probably all got examples of grandparents or people we knew that we're in their 70s or 80s, but we're largely like immobile and like frail. And we know more now about, about how we can look after our bodies and our physiology. And we are living longer generally, thanks to advances in medicine, but it's, it's about the quality of life as well. Do you want to live to 100, but spend 80 to 100 trapped in your armchair? Or do you want to make it to 95, still, still enjoying walking and being out and around with friends and, and moving your body? Yeah, 95 and active is absolutely possible. I come from a family who are, like, who are like that. I've had two people in my family live to over 100, and they both had similar attitudes to life. They follow those blue zone things, eat well, move a lot, be very social, keep your mind active. But equally, we have people who are 80 and are ready to be housebound, and that's very sad. But talking about that now in the context of andropause, what are some of the things that men can start to do when they're 
beginning to feel the impact of this test. I think, first of all, just have a bit of em- a bit of sympathy and a bit of empathy for yourself. What's happening to you? A lot of men will go into this, this kind of blame cycle going, oh, it's my fault. And they can get a bit of a hole. And I understand it. I've been in that hole myself and it can seem very hard to climb out of it. But unless you start taking those steps, that hole just going to get deeper and deeper. So it's about looking at where you can make small changes to start with because you don't want to overwhelm your subconscious by going, oh, I'm going to make a hole. So I'm going to, I'm going to go from eating you know, junk food every day to, to existing on tofu and lettuce. It's not going to happen for you. It's about making small changes and then building on them. It's just how we, that's how we engineer sustainable change for long term. What are we thinking? If you're carrying too much body fat right now, like that is a health risk. So start to look at that. Start to look at how you can reduce your body fat. Simplest way to do that is just start moving more. Yes, ideally, you want to start doing resistance training. So that could be weights in the gym. It could be at home with your body weight. It could be with simple equipment like resistance bands. Why do we want to do that? Remember, we're losing our muscle mass. Our bones are getting less dense. Resistance training preserves muscle mass and it keeps our bone density up. So you want to do that. We also want to move our body with uh, to get, improve our cardiovascular fitness as well. Getting out, going for walks, doing stuff that you might enjoy, like bike riding, swimming, running, whatever. Just do what you enjoy. There's no prescriptive. Yes, some things work better than others, but do what you love. So start moving your body more, number one. Then attack the other side of the energy equation for, for being overweight. And that is start, just start to clean up your diet because it'll feel hard when you start. But over time, if you're making small changes, it will start to feel more natural to you. If you love eating chocolate cake, that's great. You don't need to give up chocolate cake, but just have it go, right, now. that's going to be my, my treat on a Saturday rather than five days a week. And then you'll really appreciate it more. And start educating yourself. Say, what a great whole foods I can be eating. We always say from seal, field or seed to table, there's a few steps in between as possible and a rainbow of natural colors on your plate. If you follow that, you really can't go that far wrong. Cut out ultra processed foods massively cut out sugar it's in all our foods it's hidden in so many foods it's inflammatory to our system it's inflammatory to our brains it exacerbates the the symptoms of menopause and andropause it's just sugar is evil it's highly calorific or it causes anxiety it causes depression and it's hidden in so much of our food so start to educate yourself on food labels and look for those high sugar foods and start to take them out of your diet so move do things and i always say Work on your mindset, which is where you'll get the real results. People always get hung up on what I call the external, which is like the eating and the drinking, which we need to do. But it's about making those internal changes. What are my limiting beliefs that could be holding me back? What would I like to believe about myself? Who do I want to be in six months, a year from now? Start modeling that and start actually like being it. Like a really powerful thing that I do and I work with clients on is it's like, a morning gratitude practice before you get up and you let the world in, just sit and be still and just mentally or write them down. Go through things in your life that you're grateful for, three great things from yesterday you're grateful for, an intention for the day. And it sounds silly and it sounds woo woo. It's actually backed by now by neuroscience and workout positive psychology fields. This stuff does change your outcomes. You know, it, 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 it like reduces anxiety, it reduces depression, it makes you more positive. Over time, doing these things, which take a few minutes each day, you will start to notice differences. So it's about making these small changes, but especially not neglecting the mindset because so much of andropause and similarly for menopause is caught up in the mental stuff. If you feel your body's letting you down, you're just not feeling like on top of your game, you're, you're low, what can change that? Actually working on the mind, the most powerful muscle we have, it's not really a muscle, but the, the brain and the mind and getting that in gear and getting that on the journey with you. Yeah, I, you're right. The external factors are important. We know that. And I think men who end up on their own, because we often talk about a relationship, but men who end up on their own often don't have the baseline skills that take them too so easily as women do to the healthy eating. No, it's true. And I think something you said earlier, like a, a lot of women do, unfortunately, have, have a lifetime of, of kind of dieting mentality hammered into them through exposure to our media. So they tend to be more aware of their food choices. A lot of men still come to this place of, oh, yeah, I, I can still eat the double cheeseburger. I'll, I'll burn it off with 10 minutes on the rower. Guys, you absolutely will not. The food and drink that you got away with in your 20s, you cannot get away with. When I was in my 20s, yeah, sure, I could go out and drink a load of pints and have a burger and a kebab and the rest of it and get away with it. Absolutely not now. So it's about educating yourself. I say a really useful skill for guys, whether you're on your own or not, guys, Start learning to cook even basic stuff because hey, it's fun and you know, it, you'll know you eat better quality food as a result. And I think as partners, we can support, support our male partner by showing them the way because sometimes we're just that bit more interested and 
of the eating. Yeah, I think if you're in a partnership, particularly in midlife, communication is key and being open and talking to each other about this. And I, I know for men, they're less used to being open and they can find it quite scary to be vulnerable because again, we've got this thing about men, men to be the strong one, they need to be independent. But you know what? Maybe it's, it's time if you're feeling it to say, I'm just not feeling great in myself at the moment. And I'm not really sure what's going on for me. You know, reassure them. I, I know this isn't about our relationship, but I love you very much, but I'm not feeling right in myself. And then you can start to open a conversation and avoid that. Unfortunately, I've seen it happen, that chasm that can occur when people are going through their experience individually and, and not talking about what's going on for them. Yeah, and uh, we've talked a lot about this on this show with various relationship experts about bridging that gap. And I think that is a very important part. And I think if that's a real issue, then I think sometimes you need someone outside to help bring you together or a different way to work, to bring you back together and to work in a partnership. But I'd love to turn a little bit back to the mindset because you talk about gratitude practices. And, and again, I think it's about encouraging today's midlife men to come into that because often you go to a meditation class and it's 90% women you you go to it and I, I'm, I when I trained as a mindfulness practitioner there would be like two men one of them would be gay and the other one and then it's all then it then it's all women and that can feel very intimidating for men how do men then get more into those practices which are so good for them on top of the mindset practices Again, I'd say start with the small steps. There's not really a right way and wrong way to do it. So starting with a simple practice you can do at home on your own. You, you don't have to share it with anyone. You don't have to tell your partner. You can just say, look, every, minute, every morning now, I just want five minutes on my own in solitude. If you're shy about it, lock yourself in the toilet and do it, you know, something like that. But to start your own little practice of what makes you feel good, look, l listen for the feedback on, on what's working for you, what's not. And as you get more confident, I'd start going online because – for all the evils of social media, that it is a great place where you can meet like-minded community. You can dip your toe in. You can find little communities where you can hang out. You don't have to be visible to start with. You can just be in the background. You can be listening to what other people are suggesting and saying. When you're getting your confidence, you could then start to input yourself. And then from there, you can move to actually maybe go, going to a live event, a meditation circle, a mindfulness practice, and just seeing how you're getting on. It's about suspending judgment on those when you go. But I know for a lot of men, it can be uncomfortable. So I'd suggest you know, just start at home and do what men love doing is researching. Do some research around it. Do some reading about it on the internet. Order a book. Order a book. There are great books. Um, I've got one. What was it? The Miracle Morning or the Five Minute Miracle Morning. Just every day it gives you a little exercise to do. Things like that are, are fantastic just to get you started. Yeah. And that's just like you said, start small. Same with the diet. Same with the exercise. Start small and build it up. Yeah, it's the key. You, you'll know from your work with, with psychology, you know, if our subconscious is a wonderful tool, but also self-limiting. If we try and make a really drastic change, it's just going to kick back hard. Go, no, you don't. Yeah, and I think men too actually practice a good dose of compassion for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say to men as well, if you're feeling this way, don't be afraid to maybe reach out to a trusted male friend and ask them because you might be surprised that they'll say that they've experienced something similar or they're feeling the same way. Men, men are, again, good at bonding over surface things, but don't tend to have deeper conversations. But I think it's time we started having them. Yeah, I think actually communication probably more than anything is often a turning point for many. And I've seen some great initiatives go through with that, getting men to come together in man caves or whatever we want to call them. But safe places for men to talk, to connect. One of my teachers has always said there should be mindfulness for men, not just mindfulness for women. And he's always talked about just this safe space where men can talk, be heard without judgment. Yeah, I think it's absolutely needed. And there's probably more men out there looking for it, but not knowing where to start or even unaware that such things exist. And again, I would say this is one of the areas where social media has got positive. You can find groups. If you type in, you know, into your social network the groups, you can find them and you can just dip your toe in the water. Exactly. And I have great hope for the, my son's generation because I think they have far less boundaries and borders. They're far more into this. They're much more likely to seek mental health support. So I hope that's the future and that may well change the face of andropause the same way as it's very much changing the conversation around menopause yeah i hope so it'd be good good to, to open up those conversations even more i agree i totally agree james it's been a pleasure talking to you how can people find out more about you and the work that you and claire do 
So you can find us at themidlifementors.com. We have a free Facebook community, which is the Midlife Mentors community, I think. Uh, and then our handle on Instagram is just Midlife Mentors. So that's probably enough ways to get a hold of us. We'll put you in the show notes as well so people can find you and follow up from this. Thank you so much for coming on and opening yeah, a small window on andropause and how men and their partners can support them through this life change. Oh, thank you, Clarissa. It's been amazing. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for listening to Thriving Through Menopause. If you like this podcast episode, please hop over to my website, thrivethroughmenopause.com and rate and review it. And thank you if you do that, because it helps others to find the show. Want more news and views on perimenopause and menopause? Then sign up to my weekly newsletter, Heart of Menopause, over on Substack. Thank you once again for listening. And see you next week for another guest interview helping you to thrive through menopause.